everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. This is the week of Spiel Digital, or Essen, uh, the Essen Spiel Fair that we go to online this week. It will be the digital week of it, and we'll be playing a lot of live games here on the Dice Tower. A little bit more about that later. First of all, I want to say thank you to Pandasaurus for sponsoring Board Game Breakfast, and we're talking about the new game, Gods Loves Dinosaurs, which is coming out this week. Uh, you can see us. We played a live game game of it uh, previously on the Dice Stars. You can see how it plays and we're giving out uh, three copies of this to folks in North America. All you got to do to enter this is email us at contest.dicetower.com and put the word love L-O-V-E in the subject line and we'll pick three winners by next board game breakfast. If you win, we'll let you know through email that you have won. We also want to say thank you to some of our Kickstarter backers, to Bradley Encon, to Taylor Gardner, to Aaron Streselitz and the Time Warp Labs team in the first game of Tropia. Thank you all. We really appreciate your supporting our show. We hope you enjoy it. With that being said, I'm excited about this. We got a lot of cool things coming. So let's get started with this show. Here we go. So here's an interesting thing I found on the internet from at Sarah Adkins put this together, a digital music based on playing the game of Go. I've done these things before where I've, you know, you, you play music and you pick different spots on here and it runs through and it plays some synthetic music. It's not great music. Uh, I'm not sure a computer can design great music, although I guess if you pick how it works, you are technically designing the music. This is a Go game, but I thought it was a little kind of fascinating. This is something different. This is taking Go and putting it, mixing it with music and I don't know. You just have to watch the video. I found it to be soothing and interesting. So something totally off the wall, that's what I found on the internet this week. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University. Today we have Alchemists, the game that was released a few years back and still get played because it's very unique. Yeah, it's kind of, it's one of uh, Czech Games' classics and it's a game that it links in the Czech game style of worker placement game with a full grid logic puzzle. And that logic puzzle is one that you need to learn. I needed to learn it before playing this game from Terran. Oh, by the way, we do have the how to play video for this one on our channel, Midway University. And Terran did a really good, um, I'm like, I'm totally biased here, but Terran did really good puzzle logic deduction tutorial. So if, you know, like me, I really need to learn how to um, deduce the puzzle like really efficiently. Yeah, it's it's always, it's an interesting game that way. If you're not all capable of doing that puzzle, mm -hmm. or if you don't all go into it knowing how to do the puzzle efficiently, yeah. then it's actually not a very good game because you need to, you need everyone to be on a level pegging for that mm -hmm. to really play this game well. And once you get into that, it actually just becomes quite a simple worker placement game that actually has a few elements of luck in it, almost mm -hmm. more than you'd expect. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's quite a different game once you dig into it um, yep. than, than it looks like on the surface. It's still a very good game though, it's always a lot of fun. I know what you mean. We haven't tried the expansions yet. We do have the expansion. We're going to yep. give that a go one day. Yep, I think it's officially, well, by BGG, I think the expansion is the heaviest game in our collection. Oh, so we'll wow. play it at some point. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> so that's it. We are Meeple University on YouTube and also on the Dice Tower for how to play Pocket Playthrough and Life Playthrough. See you next time. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, today we're talking about Animal Alchemist. This is a... <laughs> Isn't it Animal Chemist? But no, it's one word, animalchemist, because they're alchemists. Animal chemist. It has the same words in it. Yeah, but it's animalchemist. Okay. Anyways, an animal chemist. Oh, now you got me saying that. <laughs> in this game, you start off with these, you know, you have these anthropomorphic animals. They're collecting these different ingredients for these, you know, different potions. You mix them together to make a potion. Then you mix them together again to make spells that are worth the most amount of victory points and have some special abilities. So you kind of have this ramping up of the, your ingredients to potions to spells. Um, it was so fast. The turns were just lightning fast. And it was a lot of fun. 
So this game actually has a lot of similarities to a, you know, board gaming favorite of most people, Splendor. Hey, I like it. <sighs> anyway, I liked this one because it was better. Why? It was better because the theme made sense. Splendor, nothing made sense. I didn't get it. I was really good at it. I was always dominating people, and I was like, ugh, bored. But this one, still dominating people. But I, I enjoyed it, at least, while it was happening. Because the <laughs> theming of it just made a lot more sense. And speaking of the theming, our daughter just fell in love with this game. She, at first, was like, intim you know, just didn't want to play just a, just a card game. She wanted bits. She wanted tokens. She wanted, like, some kind of figures. But just the cards, uh, she wasn't into that. She ended up falling in love with it anyways. Asked for every night since. Um, so, yeah. And a Malcolmists. Yeah, okay. It's <laughs> a good family fun time upgrading those those cards. I like it. If you want to hear more from us, you can find us on YouTube or Facebook. We are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Well, everybody, this is Ryan and Bethany. Hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs>Hey folks, today I'm going to talk real quickly about Outer Worlds. This is a game that I got for the Switch. Actually, Roy bought it for me for my birthday in September. And I tend to like games that are have a role-playing element, and that's the way Outer Worlds is. You are somebody who's on a colonist ship. Everyone's frozen. You've been woken up by a somewhat of a mad scientist, and you come out to a, for lack of better terms, it's a firefly setting. Western-ish, future in the 50s so it's kind of a, a mix there and you go from world to world these are open worlds but they're also fairly small i believe it's based on the unreal engine the moving around the graphics seem to be fine there's a, an overall story that you follow but there's also many 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 different side quests i've seen online that people have said it you, you know to finish everything takes 30 hours they must be playing a very different game than me because I know I played over 30 hours and I'm nowhere close to finishing as far as I know. I am the type of person who will be on the main quest, see something and get distracted, and I also will tend to wander around and just see what I can find by exploring. In this world, there are corporations who run everything, and you have a reputation with the corporations. You know, you're probably, you'll pick some of them to side with or even rebels to side with. Um, the, the game does a pretty decent job at first. I couldn't tell any of them apart. I can now. It also makes you feel tough about some of your decisions. At one point, I tried to negotiate a peace treaty between two factions. The one faction highly disagreed and, in fact, attacked us later on, and I felt bad about shooting them. I know, <laughs> I know it seems silly, but it just was a thing, right? We had to defend the city. I had to go out there and take out the leaders, and when I shot the one leader, I just was like, man, you know, if only you had listened to me. And that's one thing I really enjoy about this game. The game has a ton of dialogue in it. There's a lot of talking, a lot of persuading. It has a really cool um, tree of building up your reputation and uh, different skills that you can do. The fighting is okay, you know, it's just typical shooting and melee fighting. But you also get a couple companions, and they do a good job at fleshing these companions out and making them very, you know, interesting. It is an, uh, an M-rated game mostly for, I guess there's a little bit of gore, but it's mostly for language and different situations. I haven't found it to be overbearing for my part, but it's also not one that I would probably say to my kids that they should play. Uh, so far, I've really enjoyed this. It's actually one of my favorite games I've played on the Switch. I really like the jumping around. I like how different the worlds are from one another. I like the Western background motif and... There's a lot of silly humor. You know, a lot of the things people do is silly and weird. There are Easter eggs and different things you can find in spots. And there's a really cool weapon upgrade system. It's something that I'm, I mean, I'm sure at some point I'll get to a, a spot where I'm done with it. But I think overall it's something that I'm going to enjoy playing for quite a bit in the future. So definitely one to check out. I'm Tom Vassell. Oh, wait, this is not a review. We still got more Board Game Breakfast. Let's keep going. This is a segment where we take a board game based on an IP, and I tell you if the IP and the mechanisms fit well together and whether it's a game you should take a look at. Today we're looking at Jurassic Park 3, the Spinosaurus chase game. In this one, you play a character and you're running from a dinosaur and you're trying to get to the escape pod, and you don't care if anybody else gets eaten. Let's take a look at how it plays. I'll come back and tell you everything fits together. Everyone starts the game out with seven cards in their hand, Spinosaurus here, and the people here. 
On your turn, you're going to play a card. The only rule to the game is when the game starts, any card can be played. If you're going to play another dinosaur card on a dinosaur card, it has to be a higher number. You can play an escape card on top of any card. You cannot play an escape card on top of another escape card. So if an escape card is played, you know the next card has to be a dinosaur card. When somebody's out of cards or the opponent cannot play any cards, you will have won the round. Whatever card is last, if it's a dinosaur card, you will simply move that number of spaces. If the Spinosaurus was the last card, you would just move one space and you can move the Spinosaurus two spaces. If it was an escape card that was played, you'd always move one space and then whatever number is here. So in this case, you would move two spaces and the Spinosaurus would get to move two spaces also. You can always move diagonal if you choose. If you land on a spot with somebody else, you just move to the next available spot. If the Spinosaurus ever catches you, you have to move one space away from the final escape. The first play person to reach final escape is your winner. The IP makes sense that you're running from the dinosaur and you gotta get to the escape route in order to win the game. That's fine. The fact that you want other people to be eaten by the dinosaur and not yourself is a little bit off topic here and that might be bothersome. So nobody actually gets eaten. You just have to move backwards further in this little race that you're doing as you're going through. It's a fine little game how you're playing the cards. That's okay. What else do you expect from a game like this? So I would say now, is is this a game that you want to buy? Probably not. I think the cards is light enough for little kids. They'll have a good time out of it. But there are some really cool Jurassic Park games out there that I think I would rather have rather than this one. So this one will be a purge for me. So what is happening on the Dice Tower this week? Well, we're doing some of our normal stuff. You'll see a few videos going up today. Uh, Z will be doing at 10 o'clock his uh, What's Happening. So you see a couple things. Wednesday, we're doing crowd surfing. Thursday, we're doing breakfast. And then Tuesday, we're doing a preview of the next game in the Dice Tower Essentials line, which is going on um, uh, Kickstarter this week, and that's Freedom 5. I'm really excited about this. It is a cooperative game from Richard Launius that's in the family of like Defenders of the Realm, but this is done with uh, people, heroes with superpowers uh, from, well, specifically the Sentinels of the Multiverse Universe. So we're going to be playing through a game of that and we hope you come along for that. And that is just the beginning. Wednesday through Saturday, which matches up with Spiel Digital, we're, we're, we're not going to do live stuff on Sunday, but Wednesday through Saturday, throughout each day, we're going to be playing a multitude of different games live. For example, we'll be playing Holy Hair, we'll be playing Bees, The Batman Who Laughs, um, and uh, Chronicles of Crime 1400, and many more. We're going to put a schedule up at our guild at Board Game Geek and on Facebook, so you can see where those are, so just go to those and you'll see the schedules. Many of them are probably scheduled already on our channel as we speak and we'll be playing live through them here at the studio. Stella and Ella will also be taking a look at them so we hope that you can come and see several of these games to see if there's something that interests you. We're looking forward to it. We got a lot of different games we're going through. Uh, Kingdom Rush, um, some games from CGE. And there's a lot of different games that we'll be talking about so we hope that it's a fun experience for everybody involved. So that's what's mostly going on this week. Not not as many reviews. There will be a few reviews that go up over the course of the week, but it's mostly going to be those live plays, which sometimes I think are better than a review because we're not necessarily giving you an opinion. We're showing you how the game actually plays. So hopefully that's fun this week. We would have loved to have been at Spiel Digital, but or I spiel actually in person. Can't ha that can't happen this year, so this is the next best thing. And that's what's coming from the Dice Tower this week. Hi, I'm Monique from Girls Game Shelf, and today I'd like to talk to you about my favorite character, Sophie Hatter from Hell's Moving Castle, and three games I would like to play with her. First one is Saucy Grannies. She really encapsulates what it means to be someone in your own power as you age, and I would like to see more of that in how she plays Saucy Grannies. Who's the best? Who takes control in the kitchen? Let's see it. The other one is an RPG called Brindlewood Bay solving mysteries, looking into the darker side of magic, and getting to investigate the whodunit. I love all of those things. And I'd love to play with her, who has a very quick mind and is very observant, but also very bold. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Another one, and final one, that I'd like to play with Sophie Hatter is Kokoro, Avenue of the Kodama, a flip and write game. You're getting to build paths through sanctuaries, and I'd really like to see how she handled the conflict of not making the most optimal choice but not realizing it until later on down the line. 
So those are three games I would like to play with Sophie Hatter from Halloween Castle. What is a character that you would like to play board games with? What board games did you play with them? I'll see you next time. Bye. Hey guys, it's Deanna. Today I'm gonna to share with you another educational game you can play with your kids. And today's game is called Silly Sentences. In Silly Sentences, you are using puzzle-like tiles to create sentences and review parts of speech. Articles, nouns, verbs, and preposition tiles are included in the game. There are two levels of gameplay, one for younger kids and one for older kids. So far, I've been playing this game with my 7 and 10 year old. At the beginning of the game, the noun cards are placed in the center of the table and the remaining tiles are divided up among the players. Players will sort their tiles into piles using the color at the top of the tile as a guide. On your turn, you can do one of three actions. You can lay a tile from your pile with a noun tile. You can lay a tile from your pile with an adjective and a noun or you can add a verb tile to an existing sentence. Players can play off of each other's sentences or choose to start a new one. Play continues until one player uses up all of their tiles and wins the game. So far, we have really enjoyed playing this game. Some of our sentences were fairly normal towards the beginning of the game, but towards the end, it starts getting pretty silly because of your limited number of options. Silly Sentences is a very simple and straightforward game, but it's a great way to practice different parts of speech, especially with younger kids who are just learning about you know, nouns and adjectives and articles and all those things. And that's gonna be it for today. I hope you guys will enjoy the rest of Board Game Breakfast, and I'll see you next time with another educational game. Bye. Hey there everyone, it's Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with my segment From the Page to the Table, where I pair a book and a board game together that share a common theme. This week I'm going to show a book that I recently finished on audio and oh, mwah, mwah, and that is Circe by Madeline Miller. Here she takes someone who has been somewhat maligned throughout history, Circe, our titan goddess here, and brings her to life um, with her own story. We see Odysseus, we see Jason, all these characters that we know from Greek mythology, and all of our gods, uh, Apollo, Athena, um, Zeus, these and they're so vividly brought to life. Um, so when you are looking to play your favorite game that has Greek gods and goddesses, you are of course going to uh, bring out Cyclades, Cyclades, however you are choosing to pronounce it by Madigo. Our version here I think is two to five players, uh, 60 to 90 minutes, ages 13 and up. Um, and you know you have the introduction of the monsters, the Greek uh, classical monsters as well, and just I think one of our modern classics of sorts. Some people will say that they like Inish better or Kemet, um, so I guess we can debate that in the comments below which one is your favorite of kind of Madigo's epic classic games. That is all for this week. As a reminder, don't forget to subscribe over to the Literary Gamers where this mild-mannered <laughs> librarian and her writer husband uh, team up and talk about books, board games, and anything else under the sun. Happy breakfast! beginning of a, a, a mini series that I'll be doing with Tom Thanks. It's going to be two or three long. Um, and in this one, I want to talk about other people that we deal with in the board game industry. So today we're going to specifically talk about designers slash publishers and bad actors or people that we might have a problem with. Uh, so this will happen. It happens in every industry and essentially the argument is can you separate the artist from the art? Like can you go back for example and watch the Bill Cosby show 
knowing what Bill Cosby did later on in life, or actually at that time in life, but was found out later on in life. Can you watch a movie by a director who you have a problem with, and where do you draw those lines? Same thing happens with board games. Can I play a board game from somebody who designed it or published it, and I consider that person to be someone in bad faith. Maybe it's someone I disagree with what they think in life. Maybe it's someone who has done something wrong, whether they've been a crook or something else. How do you deal with that? And each person's gonna have to deal with it differently. I have tried to, for the most part on Dice Tower, to put aside that sort of thing. If I'm gonna review a game, doesn't matter who published it, doesn't matter who designed it, I'll review it. That sort of thing doesn't matter. Every once in a while I'll review a game, someone says, you know, so-and-so designed this. Okay, but I'm talking about the game. I'm not talking about what that person has done in life. Now, I think it's perfectly acceptable for someone to say, I do not wish to give money to this company or to this designer because of blah, 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 blah. That's a legitimate thing. I am less interested when those people try to impose their thoughts on somebody else. So let's say publisher XYZ has stolen money or done something bad, uh, or it's at least they've done something that people consider to be shady. And so I pull out their new game, hot game, and I want to play it with you. And you're like, look, I don't want to play this game because of this company. I would be understanding of that. That's not a problem. I think that's legit. I wouldn't even want to do it with you because I know it would bother you. It's if you called me up and said, I know you own this game, you need to get rid of it. Then, I'm, then I feel like you're more infringing on what I want and what I have. Um, if you don't want to do it, I won't do it with you. I do not wish to be an offense, but I don't believe me actually owning the game is an offense to you. And if it is, I think that's something that you're going to have to work on rather than myself. Now, this happens occasionally here in Dice Tower, and sometimes we have not reviewed things in the past because maybe they've offended me in some sort of way. Very rare, but that sort of thing can happen. But for the most part, I know there's controversial designers. I know there's controversial publishers. There are designers who I diametrically disagree with on a personal level. Some of them are blogs and, and social media, and I've looked at what they said, and I'm, I'm really opposed to that. But when it comes to playing the game, that doesn't really matter. Now, maybe it matters a little bit if they're designing a game about that particular subject, but that's very rarely the case. Publishers are a little different. You can say, why should we give money to this publisher when they did this practice here? And then sometimes it's going to come to how bad you think that practice is or should be. I think everyone has to draw that line somewhere, someplace. Can you listen to music if you disagree with the artist? Can you watch a movie or TV show if you disagree with the artist? For many things, I can. Sometimes I can't. Sometimes I can't watch something because I know what that actor has done. And I think the same thing can be said in the board game arena. I might not be able to play a board game designed by someone who I highly disagree with on something. It's not as big of a deal for me, but I can see it being a big deal for other people. I just think we have to be cautious about foisting off those things on other people. I'm not even saying necessarily you can call attention to it like, hey, did you know so-and-so did something? But if it doesn't seem to bother that person, I don't know how much more I'm going to push him. Like, you need to get rid of all those games out of your collection. Because I think at the end of the day, it's the board game itself is not an evil thing. The board game itself is a neutral thing, and we can enjoy that and have a good time with it. That's what I think. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle and I'm from the YouTube channel Board Game Bakes. This week I'm going to show you how you can make your own Disney Villainous Cookies. On my full video I show you how to make all the Disney cookies, but I'm just going to focus on one for this brief clip. Hope you enjoy it! One is Captain Hook. And this is also based on the figurine, so it's the hat with the feather and it has scarf on his vest. This one's fun too. Well, fine. They're all fun. But you just have to have some favorites. So once it's all outli outlined, I filled in the middle part. And then filled in the feather. And once again, I did some wet on wet techniques to try and get it to look more like a feather. So I just did a line down the center 
and pulled away from the line to give it more of a feathered look. Next, I went red and filled in the jacket and the hat. And then, like the Queen of Hearts, I just filled in the empty space with black, since it is villainous. And the final detail is to add the lines for a scarf, so this way it looks like Captain Hook. Thanks for watching this quick overview for how to make your own Disney villainous spice brown sugar cookies. If you want to see how to make the rest of the cookies, find my channel Board Game Bakes and please hit subscribe. Keep playing games and keep them sweet. Bye! Howdy folks, welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from the Family Showdown. This episode of By the Numbers, we're continuing my Through the Years series, where I look at the best game on Board Game Geek by year. We started way back in 1970, this time. The Lost 1992 episode. Take a look at the top five from 1992. We see the number one game is Modern Art, coming in at 225. Modern Art is an auction game. In fact, the players will be doing four different kinds of auctions throughout the game. It's part of Reiner Knizia's so-called auction trilogy, which includes the game Medici, Medici, and Raw. It's sandwiched in the middle of those two. The Raw higher rated, Medici lower rated, and Modern Art right in the middle. When looking at this game, the first thing I thought of, because I haven't played it before, is there's a Jackbox game called Bidiots, which reminds me a lot of the rules of this game. The only difference is the players actually draw the art in Bidiots, whereas in modern art it uses, you know, just cards for, for artwork. Take a look at the ratings, over 16,000 of them. We see tons of sevens for an overall rating of 7.4. Take a look at the way it comes into the 2.3, which sounds about right for this game. Even though it's a pretty simplistic auction game, there are four different types of auctions and rules for how each of those are conducted. So if you're looking for a light little introductory, well, what I would call introductory, auction game, you might try to find modern art, although it looks like it's kind of out of print right now, but it's been reprinted numerous times, so I'm sure it'll be back in print real soon. See you next time. Hello! My name's Dan, this is Cora, and we're here today to talk to you about Cora Quest, <laughs> which is our cooperative dungeon uh, crawling uh, family game yeah. for, for kids and adults to play, isn't it? It's a game we designed ourselves. Yeah. And well, what was the most enjoyable thing about making Cora Quest for you, Cora? The drawing. The drawing and, and the creativity. Yeah. And we had so much fun creating the characters the, and drawing the characters and the, the quests. Yeah, so we thought we were going to let other people do that as well. Yeah, like, that's you know, it. Characters, buddies, bosses, quests, or... Treasures, <laughs> everything, everything. So so we decided that a key part of Cora Quest that we, wanted, we were really quite passionate about yeah. was to let other people great things for it too, wasn't it? Yeah, make it, it like customizable, customizable, but also so you can play it out of the box, you don't have to make all these things before you have to play it. You can you can do that if you want to, but you can also just play it straight out of the box. You're a much better, much better salesman than me, it must be said. <laughs> you can, you can play it straight out of the box, but you can also customize it. Yeah. And we've had, um, the play testers we've had, and, and some people who are members of our uh, Facebook group, Facebook group down here, look. <laughs> um, they've been helping us uh, do some things. And so, so without further ado, I'd like to show you some stuff that, that people have done for us and then that Gary has garified. <laughs> That's what we like to call it when our artist Gary kind of colours in. Starting from right now. So this one, this one is, uh, I don't know what this one is, I've forgotten what it I is. I think it was the Ring of Teleportation. Uh, no, I think no, it's an was... amulet. Oh. It looked like a ring initially. I think it was done yeah. as a ring. Yeah. And then, watch what Gary does. <laughs> it's a ring of uh, it's an amulet. What is it? Amulet of nimbleness. Well done, Atticus. That's Atticus. that's great. And this is this is by Gabby. This is a a ring of swiftness, I think. Or, mm -hmm. or ring of I speed. Can't, I can't remember how meant how. What, I think it was called a ring of speed. Yeah, ring of speed, something like that. It looks cool how he's put the little shines on the. Yeah, the diamonds. Yeah. Ring of speed. Yeah, Gabby's ring of speed. Gabby. Um, has been on the Dice Tower too. And look at this little cute hedgehog, <laughs> Rhea. 
Um, and, Via. Yeah. Via. Uh, into a into a shield. <laughs> a shield of shieldness. <laughs> so those are some of the things that people have done, and you can do it too. This is why we're we're saying this because we're we're looking we're for. We're not just like. Here's some stuff. That we can play. <laughs> Here's some cool stuff, and you can't play. Yeah. You can play too because we're looking for new drawings for Cora Quest. Yeah. Um, so if you go to CoraQuest.com, yeah. <laughs> you can CoraQuest.com. Like, you can sign up to our newsletter, and in that newsletter there will be details of how to uh, submit your drawings to us, yeah. and and we'll put them in the game. That's the that's the plan anyway. We're yeah. gonna put, put as many many different kids game drawings in the game. Yeah. So there you go. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. So here we go. That's the end of a board game breakfast, but it leads into the week of Spiel Digital. Lots of games we're going to play this week, so I need to get going here. We're going to set these games up. We're going to be playing through them. Like I said, keep an eye on the schedule. Some of the many of the games will have contests involved, so we hope you enjoy that also. Well, that's it. Let's get going. Thank you again to all my contributors. Thank you to our Kickstarter backers. Thank you to everybody who helps make the Dice Tower a great place to learn about games. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.